Good to see everybody. How you all doing? Everybody good? All right. Good. I'm glad you're good. Sounds like you are awake. Not at all, but don't worry, you will be. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get you there. We'll get you there. It's good to see everybody. Um, so, so glad that you are here. Um, we have some very special guests uh, this morning. You're all here. You're all guests. Isn't that great? Uh, but every week, we, we, we never know who's going to be here. And we have some special guests this morning um, that I'm going to actually ask to come up for a minute. They don't know I'm doing this, so I'm going to put them on the spot. Um, but they can, they're, they're guessing right now that I'm probably mean them. And so, uh, Mel and Noah, you can come on up. My sister and her husband are here, Mel and Noah. They are missionaries in Oaxaca, Mexico. I picked them up at the airport. I don't know what time it was. It was very late. It was very late, and they had very tired children. But it was great to see them, and they're in for a couple weeks. If they're going to be in our small groups, in our branches group, uh, is that, when is that, Vic? Was that this Wednesday? Wednesday. So if you come Wednesday, you get a chance to talk to them more. But guys... First of all, great to see you. Great to have you here. Um, and just give us an update. How are things going? Man, it doesn't have to be super long, whatever you want, but just give us a quick update. You know, welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, but they didn't turn it on yet. There you go. Blue. Blue. Here we go. There you go. Should I say it again? There you go. <laughs> no, I said, you ever give a missionary a mic and say it's not going to be super long? So I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> she is my sister, yes. So believe it or not, seven right. years younger than me. Seven years, but she calls me her little brother. It's not okay. Not okay. <laughs> We're going to try to sum up a year and a half in about 30 seconds. No, you can take, take your time. Because <laughs> no, no. no um, first of all, just thank you so much for supporting us prayerfully, financially. We know that um, you guys do, and so that's what carries us. Every day we're facing some new obstacle, whether it's in the home with the family or whether it's all the things having to do with ministry and living in another culture. But um, prayer is what gives us the strength to go through, So, and finances allow us to be there. So thank you sincerely from our hearts. And um, we know that it's not just us, too, that they have a heart for missions, and you support many missionaries. And so God blesses that. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we, we've been crazy busy. We just got done with our first missions team that we hosted. It was a group from Mississippi, so we had to, you know, endure the accent. But um, no, it was, I asked, and they said nobody was named Bubba. I had nobody. Uh. <laughs> but it was an incredible time, and we got to go into to different neighborhoods and um, different villages and do some kids outreaches and work with some pastors that we've developed relationships with. And one comment that that a number of them made was just like, "Wow, you have really good relationships with with the pastors here." And that's, that's like totally from God because that's what was one of our prayers. Like we want to build relationships and build trust. And so um, we praise God that we're doing that. Um, we're also reaching out into villages up in the mountains. Uh, I am part of a Bible institute for indigenous um, Christians. What that means is that they speak another language other than Spanish. Um, so there's, there's about 16 different major language groups in Oaxaca. But we have two extensions going of that. About 11 students, one's as young as 14, and this kid's a boss. He's bilingual, <laughs> and he's just, he's just dominating it. And then we have him up to like 50, a guy who's pastored for like 20 years and is more of a missionary than I will ever be, just going around and, and all that. But uh, they're hungry for the Word of God. They're hungry for, for teaching in a way that they can understand. Um, they, they don't have the, the academic background to just go and just consume tons of information. So... Um, so that's, that's what I'm up to and what we're up to. Do you want to say anything? Usually. <laughs> <laughs> Hate you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, Noah mainly does a lot of the, like, outside the home ministry. Our kids are little. They're five and six. And so my main concern this term has been getting them adjusted because the goal is to be here for as long as humanly possible or until Jesus tells us to leave. So... Are, you know, we're going to be coming back for furlough next year, so we've been working really hard with the kids to learn Spanish, to get all that under their belt, to get accustomed. I mean, our kids are doing great. Aubrey, the other day, um, it was hot out. I brought her a change of clothes and a picture from school, and I said, here, honey, you can get change. And she goes, Mom, I don't get hot. I'm Mexican. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> so they're doing just fine. <laughs> they love the food. They speak Spanish to everybody. Jesse is very loud and very vocal and, and is the same way in Spanish. So he makes friends, no problem. <laughs> and um, we've been able to find out ways to involve them in ministry, which has been cool. This, this the end of the, the summer, we're going to be launching a new after-school program 
that is mainly based on music in the Missions House. So we're really looking forward to that, involving the kids even more. And we're just really excited because we feel like for the first term, we've been doing what we wanted to do and we feel like the Lord has told us to do. So again, I just thank you so much for supporting us. We literally can't be there without you guys. So thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much. Great to have you here. Great to see you guys. And uh, yeah, if you see them in the, out there, make sure you talk to them and uh, let them know you're praying for them. And uh, they're, they're just awesome and great. Glad to have you guys back. It's awesome to see you. I didn't know you were coming today, so it was awesome. To, so this was all not arranged. So anyway, and it just so happens, because, you know, it just so happens. That's our life tree story, right? It just so happens, because this is just so happens Sunday, um, because it just so happens that they're here, and it just so happens that I was going to talk a little bit about our missions trip to Mexico. Uh, in, in six days from now, 14 members of our church family, as you saw in the video, will be heading to Tlajumoco, Mexico, which is outside of Guadalajara. Uh, we'll be spending a week there serving the church uh, there and spending time. We're going to be laying some block. Uh, they're, they're building, a, as you heard, a community center church thing, and so we're going to be helping them lay some block and uh, mix some concrete and rebar and all that kind of stuff. We're going to take some time to visit a uh, youth rehab center, a couple youth rehab centers, hopefully, and encourage the kids that are there and maybe share some of our stories with them and just, just encourage them. Through the years, we've done a lot of these trips with our church. We started doing trips in 2014, so it's been nine years of missions trips for LifeTree. So if you've been on any trips with us before, raise your hand. Raise your hand. So you can look around. We've got a number of people throughout here. So guess what? There's a lot of hands that aren't up yet. Uh, so good. There's, a, there's, there's opportunities for you here. Um, many of you have participated not so much by just going, but you've been giving. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's been giving to help us go, right? You're sending. You saw the chart, like we're almost there. It's, it's awesome. Uh, we, we're, we're excited to go do that stuff. So thank you for, for giving. You're participating. Either going or sending, you're participating. Um, and now I know most of you in the room would say mission trips are great. They're awesome. They're wonderful. They're meaningful. They're noble. They're good stuff. However, however, I know that there's probably one of you here, just one, just one that that back here in your head, you wonder, like, what, you don't want to say it out loud, but like, really what difference is going on a one-week missions trip really going to make? I mean, are you really going to be helping anybody? I mean, I mean, I know I'm sure there's like, you'll be a good experience, and you get the food, and you'll go help, but like, isn't, does it, it's a great idea, and we don't want to take away from all that, but I mean, we're spending a lot of money to send people for a few days to a church where there's already missionaries and pastors and people there doing something else. So like, why are you going to do what's already being done? Nobody thinks that, but I know there's one of you, and I'm not going to point you out. The reality is that's a very, very valid question. And we wonder, you know, is this just an attempt to make ourselves feel better about ourselves? Like we're doing something good? Like we're going to go play missionary for a week? Is it, I mean, we're a small group of relatively unqualified people that are going. I don't know if you know that or not, but we're not Mexican culture experts, right? We haven't been studying Guadalajara. Our Spanish is, hmm, así, así, right? It's, it's okay. It's uh, Solamente, you know, hablo un poquito de español, solamente un poquito. Right, just a little bit. Some are better than those. I can order off a menu. That's what I could do. I could order off a menu. Um, we've not spent time studying the people. We're not professional construction workers. I know Jay is, but not, not according to this style of construction. And you can ask him, and he will tell you no. He knows how to do it here, not there. It's different. So we're not really, we're not really trained for that. We're just a group of people from New Jersey and one from Pennsylvania. Thank you, John. Um, going for a few days to give what we have. And while no one would argue that, it makes, that it's not going to make some difference, here's the thing. Does it make enough of a difference to justify the investment of time, energy, resources it's going to cost? I appreciate that. Uh, it's a really important question. And it's important to answer. We have to answer it. And here's why we need to answer it. Because if we're going to do stuff like this, clearly I think it's worth it because we're going. But if we're going to do stuff like this, we have to know why. We have to answer questions like that because it's, 
This is a collective effort, and we have to know why are we doing stuff like this? Why is this so much a focus of our church? Why do we support 50 missionaries and organizations? Why do we tithe 10% of everything that comes into missions? Why are we giving money to a project when there's already people there? Why are we doing this stuff? History actually records for us one of the very first missions trips ever. And it was a short-term trip. It was not long. It did not, uh, and that was for another reason we're going to find out in a minute. But it was brief, and the people who went really weren't qualified. And it's going to give us some insight into, this, into our situation today. So we're going to look at that story. Um, the gospel writer Luke captures it for us in the book of Acts. So if you'd like to turn to Acts uh, chapter 14, we're going to be there in just a minute. It involved the apostle Paul and a traveling companion named Barnabas. Uh, so you've probably heard of those two guys. And they took a journey through several towns. All right, we're going to read that in just a moment. But before I get to their story, I need to tell you another story. And this story is a legend. It's a legend from days of old. And according to this legend, the Greek gods, Zeus, who's on the left there and then one with the hat, is, is Hermes, his son. And they once came to a region known as the uh, Phrygian Hill Country disguised as mortals and looking for lodging. So, you know, you're talking Greek mythology, right? There's the god Zeus and his son Hermes. They come, right, dressed as, look at, like, just looking like regular people. Just, they just weren't wearing a shirt because he's just, you know, a Zeus. Um, so that's according to the painting. Um, looking for lodging. And the legend says that they asked at a thousand homes and nobody took them in. And finally, at a humble cottage of straw and reeds, a couple, an elderly couple by the name of Philemon and Baucis, freely welcomed them with a banquet that strained their, you know, resources. These people did not have much, but they gave, they gave everything they had. And in appreciation, the gods rewarded them. They transformed their cottage into a temple with a golden roof and beautiful marble columns, right? And then they, they appointed Philemon and Baus as priest and priestess of their temple. And instead of dying, they never died. They turned into trees, it says one turned into an oak and the other into a linden tree. And as for the other people, the, the thousand people that turned them down, it says that God's destroyed them, all their homes. Just destroyed them. It's a legend. It's a nice story, isn't it? It's a good story. Um, and I tell you that for a reason, because that story is going to come into play in a minute. Because that story would have been very familiar to the people in the place that Paul and Barnabas are going to. Sometimes... You know, we've got these cultural stories that are part of our narrative here in America. When you go to other places around the world, other cultures, they have stories that influence their culture. This is one of those stories that was known to the people where Barnabas and Paul were going. Keep that in mind as we read. We're going to pick up the story. They're entering a town called Lystra, okay, which was in the Phrygian Hill country, it's, which is modern-day Turkey, right? modern-day Turkey. And it was a Roman province, so Rome kind of had ruled the world. They had a, an outpost there. This is so Roman rule, so it's in Turkey, but it's kind of overseen by Roman government, right? There's no Jewish synagogue. This is not a city. This isn't like a huge, big old place. It's, it's, it's a kind of remote area. Religiously, the people had some sort of idol worship is what they, what they, uh, what they participate in their language. <laughs> Ironically enough, wasn't normal. Uh, like, like Noah's talk about, you go to you know, Mexico, you think they don't speak Spanish, there's other dialects. Well, these people didn't speak common languages. They didn't speak Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. Aramaic. They spoke a local dialect. So very simple. It was an indigenous people group. They're, they're different, right? Populated largely by Roman retired military. Bit of a rough place. So it's sort of an outpost. It's sort of remote. No synagogue. It's just sort of out there, like a village more than like a booming metropolis. Okay, so you get in a picture. Now... Consider the fact that Paul and Barnabas aren't from here. They don't speak the language. They're not familiar with the culture. This is a mission trip. This is a mission trip. They're just, okay, God said go, we're going. So we're going to pick it up in Acts 14, verse 8. Okay, we'll pick up the story. That gives you context. It says this. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. Now remember, these are not Jewish people, okay? They're hearing about Jesus for the first time. And as this man who's sitting there, this crippled man, is hearing, is hearing Paul preaching about God, Paul could sense somehow in his spirit that this guy had faith to be healed. Isn't that like, 
It's remarkable, right? This sort of like a spidey sense, like he's tingling. I don't know how it, I don't know if there was anything different about the man's appearance. I don't know if there was anything there. I don't know how Paul knew that, but here's what we know, that the Holy Spirit can give us divine knowledge about things that are otherwise impossible to know. That's what happened here. There are times in our life where the Holy Spirit will prompt you or impress upon you something that you couldn't know otherwise. It's a spiritual gift. And in that moment, Paul saw this man crippled from birth and could tell he believed in God and could tell that God was ready to heal him. Like, I've never had that feeling. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling. That's uncommon. But he had this experience. So verse 10, it says, Paul, called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Have you ever had a moment where like the hair on the back of your neck goes up? Right? You're like, uh, when you get goosebumps because of what you're seeing and feeling, this is probably one of those moments, not just for Paul or Barnabas or for this man, but for all the people that are watching this. Because a lot of people are watching this. This was one of those moments. There's a thing. The man didn't like, he was crippled, so he's probably sitting or laying somehow. He didn't like roll over and grunt and groan and strain and gradually figure out, you know, if anything had happened, right? It says the man literally jumped to his feet and started walking. Instantly. Instantly jumped and started walking. Now, if you were able to walk, for all those walking people in, in the room or if you're listening online, if you, if you were able to walk, you didn't start that way. Right? You can go in the nursery and you can find out. <laughs> That's not what it looks like. Right? I saw uh, Caitlin had little, little baby Vic and uh, he was just sitting there and not moving because he doesn't know what to do yet. He doesn't, hadn't figured out the legs yet, right? It's just, just sitting. It's just nice when babies can sit, you know, because eventually they stop and they say start to go and parents know it's over. It's over once children start to walk. But it takes time because it's, that's the natural process, right? You Walking is a learned skill. You got to learn to manage your legs, your feet, your balance. It takes time. Babies crawl, then they stand and get wobbly and eventually take one. This wasn't natural. This man who had never walked in his life, ever since the day born, somehow in that moment, not only was healed, but knew how to walk. He jumped. He knew how to jump up, jumps up, and he starts walking immediately. You understand? This is like miracle, miracle. Like unexplainable on so many levels. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, verse 11, it says, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, remember, not a common language, these men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. So basically Barnabas was just standing there quiet. And they're like, oh, he must be in charge because he's quiet. And this guy who's doing the talking, that must be the son. They had no context for what had just happened. This was clearly not of human origin. Their only logical conclusion is that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And the only gods they knew about were Zeus and Hermes and those from sort of uh, mythological culture. Now remember the story that we talked about, the legend, right? Remember the legend about the time the gods came to the area and nobody recognized them, right? Except for the old couple. These people knew that story and guess what? They were not going to make the same mistake twice. They weren't going to get fooled. They weren't going to be the suckers who got their houses destroyed because the gods came to them and they paid them no mind. They were not going to do that. They were going to make sure the gods knew they were recognized and welcome. So listen to what they did. Verse 13, it says this, Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town. So the priest of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates. And they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. We might say it's like ridiculous to think that ordinary men are gods, right? Like, if we had just read that story without knowing anything else, you go, man, that's ridiculous. These are just normal guys. Why are they thinking they're gods? But when we understand the context of the legend, makes sense, right? Totally makes sense why they're reacting the way they are. So they're going to roll out the red carpet. But here's the thing. Remember, what language are they speaking? Not a common language. Not a language that Paul and Barnabas understood. So Paul and Barnabas don't know what's happening. They don't understand. There's all this stuff going on, right? They don't know what these people are saying. It's not clicking in their mind what's happening. All they know are that the people are very excited. Paul's like, wow, they must have really gotten moved by this healing. 
Uh, like, must say, like, this is awesome. These people are all, like, fired up. This is great. That was powerful. This is, oh, man, we're doing good. We did really good thing here. And they, they walk away, and they, all this stuff is happening. There's this hubbub. The, you know, the town's in, like, a, just going on. And, and eventually, someone who speaks the language goes, uh, Paul, Barnabas, um, let me explain what's happening right now. Because I don't think you understand. And they did not understand because we know that by their reaction when they found out. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, tearing their clothes, they're like, that's that's a a, a show of like great grief, right? They tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. When he had first started preaching, Paul probably was trying to be thoughtful and present really developed thoughts about faith and God and Jesus and the story of the cross and the resurrection and guilt and sin, how it all tied together. He was trying to present a case because that's what Paul does. It was really complex. At this moment, the message really simplifies. Paul's like, hey, let me just make it simple for you. There's one God and I'm not it. And it's not Zeus or anybody else. It's the living God. Paul tries to connect the dots for them to help them understand God in a way related to their experience. And he says this in verse 16. He says, listen, let me just make this simple for you. Let me connect it for you in your culture. In the past, go ahead. Yep. In the past, he, being God, permitted all the nations to go their own ways. But, verse 17, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. He's saying here, God permits, he allows people to go whichever way they want. God never forces anybody to do anything, right? If you want to worship the dirt or the trees or the sun or nothing at all, you can. God lets the nations go whichever way they want. He does not force anybody to do anything, but... God is so good that he will never leave anyone without evidence of his truth and goodness. And Paul highlights what that evidence is for them. He's like, hey, God, let me tell you, there's a living God out there. It's not me. It's not your idols. It's, not, it's a living God. And let me tell you, he's always had evidence. Here's the evidence. He says it's in, the nat- it's in nature. It's in the rain and the sun and the seasons. Those are evidence of God. Look around you. He says that's evidence of God. And he says it's in your provision and your good crops in your food, in your homes, what what your family needs. That's all evidence of the living God. And he says, and it's in your your heart. It's in that joy that you feel inside, right? Those sense of gratitude and blessing in your heart. That's evidence that there's a living God. Paul says there's evidence all around you. What you see, what you have, what you feel, it's all evidence of a living God. I'm going to pause here. The past few weeks... um, I've been full of graduations and birthdays for our family. Today's actually Levi's birthday. My son Levi. It's happy. happy birthday, bud. There you go. Um, we got birthdays all around. Um, it means I've made a number of trips to the Hallmark store all the time. And they always ask me, do you want the little gold things? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to put a sticker on the back of it. No, nobody wants a sticker. Thank you. Maybe you like the stickers. I don't know. I, I, I decline. Um, but I, I, when I'm looking for a card, I usually go for funny over serious. Like, I'm, I, I just don't. The sentimental, you are, you know, you know I didn't say that, you know, like, I'm not going to say that. I'll add my own commentary. Like, I'm just trying to find something that will, I think, in that moment, bring you a little bit of, like, a smirk, laugh, something ridiculous. Um, You can ask anybody. I I just like funny cards. Um, But with the graduations, I've also been taking more time than usual to think about what kind of advice to give. Right, well, how do I, how do I want to share with somebody? I, I, and I actually asked with my older son, I asked our family to come together and share advice that they would give to him. And we, I compiled it. So I've got pages and pages and pages. Of, you know, as you graduate, here's what I would. So it's, it's a great thing. I've, it's a gift we've been able to give to him of just advice through the years. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not, either as a parent or as a sibling or as a friend. Um, have you ever given someone advice like, you know it's really, really good advice. Really good advice. And they didn't do anything with it. You ever done that? You're like, man, let me tell you, this is really, really good stuff and nothing. 
Now, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, like they didn't hear it all, but it can be disappointing. You know it's good stuff, and they just... Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever experienced this, that somebody else says to them the same exact thing that you have said to them, and it's a revelation. You know what so-and-so said to me? Are you kidding me? I've been telling you that for years. But no, when, when they said it, right, when Joe Schmo over there says it, it's like the voice of God, right? right? It leaves you shaking your head. Like, what the heck? I've been... <sighs> That's what's happening here. It's literally what's happening here. God had given the people of Lystra evidence of himself, and they were missing it. He had given them it in nature. He had given it in provision. He had given it in their hearts, and they were missing it. He had so good. He let them go their own way, but he said, I'm never going to leave you without evidence, and they were missing it. So God sent Paul and Barnabas to bring more evidence. Their words were evidence. The healing God accomplished through Paul's ministry was evidence. Listen, I read a lot of John Grisham. It's just it's like candy. It's just easy to read. Right? Legal thrillers. Just yesterday I was reading a story about an innocent guy, young man, headed for conviction. The evidence was not in his favor. He didn't do it, but until, you know, the lawyer goes out there and, and hunts and he uses some, you know, subversive methods and he figures out some new evidence that uncovers that it was somebody else who did it and exonerates his client and, you know, victory. There you go, right? Same story every time, every, every John Grisham book, right? But here's the thing. New evidence changes things they already had evidence but new evidence comes proverbs actually references this says don't be too quick to tell a judge about something you saw you'll be embarrassed if someone else proves you wrong i've got evidence yes but there could be more you only know this little piece there could be more new evidence gives us new perspective in our lives New evidence gives us new perspective. This happens in our lives. We think we understand a situation until something new comes in, and all of a sudden we're like, oh, now I see that a little differently. Right? I thought it was this new evidence. Now I see more completely. The people of Lystra had evidence of God. It was all around. It was in nature, in their daily provision. It was in their hearts. But God is so good. Hear me. God is so good. He never stops sending new evidence. He never stops sending new evidence. His heart is for all people, wherever they are, to receive the eternal life he offers. It's interesting. The word for evidence in the text here can be translated witness. It comes from the Greek word uh, martos, which you can understand comes the word martyr. That's where we get that word from. In a, in a legal and historical sense, that word means someone who has seen, someone who has seen and can tell, Right? That's what it is. When it says evidence, it's a witness. It's, it's somebody who can say, hey, I was there. I saw this. I can explain what happened. In an ethical sense, it's someone whose life tells the story. Like, I am a witness to, I am a living witness to what donuts will do someone if you eat all your life. Like, I'm a witness to that, right? Like, that's what, like, that's what he's saying. It's your life, your body gives witness to something. Here's the thing. The evidence that God keeps sending is people. The people had evidence. They had nature. They had provision. They had their hearts. But God said, okay, I'm going to send them more evidence, and it's going to be called Paul and Barnabas. I'm going to send more evidence. God sends people to people who already have evidence of him because those people can add to the evidence. That's all they're doing is just adding to the evidence. The people Paul went to had evidence of God. He never leaves anyone without evidence. Yet, God still sends because adding evidence helps make things a little clearer. Yes, I've heard this before. Yes, I've understood it. But now I see it in a very different way. You may have said that a hundred times, but it took that person to say it for it to click in my head. So to connect this to the missions trip, why do we do stuff like this? Why are we doing stuff like this? If you've been through our discovery course here at Lifetree, you'll have heard us share about how we approach what we do here about our ministry at the church. 
and the sort of a, a relational model. Uh, it starts with the word faces. How many of you are familiar with this, right? You've seen this before? Faces, right? The faces are the, the people that live around us here in, in Robbinsville. Could be anywhere in the county. People, if you're at the grocery store and you see faces, people you work with, people you drive by, anybody that lives in our area, those are faces. But people you don't know. It's just faces. My grandma would say, hey, what's your face? Get over here. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You just, what's your face? So a face is just somebody out there. The next, the next level in then we get to is the familiar. These are the people that now you know. Like if you're, if you're at, you know, going into Starbucks every day and you don't just get your coffee, but you make a, a, you know, an introduction to the barista and you're like, hey, you know, this is, I'm Dan. Who are you? And you build a relationship. Next time they come in, you have a name. They're not just a face now. You can say, hey, I saw you. I know you. I've got a relationship with you. If it's a, a friend that you've made, right, somebody that you now know, they're now, they're now familiar to you. Okay, friends would be that next one. Friends are the people, and we're, again, in context of our church, who have experienced the ministry of Life Tree in some way. So they're not just familiar to you. They're not just a friend to you, but now they're a friend of the church because that means they, maybe they came to a service once, or maybe they're their son or daughter came to Rooted Youth, or maybe they did a community service project with us, or, or did something, you know, came to a small a branches group. Some way they've experienced the ministry of the church. And so you can see there's, there's progression here, right, in the relationship. They're just a face. And then, then we get to know them, and then they get to experience the church a little bit. And then the next one in, right, well, then they're family. That means that, like, okay, I, don't, I didn't just go one time, but now I'm, I'm in. I, 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 feel, I feel like I belong here. I'm part of this. I become part of the family. Right? I'm connected to this place. And there's relationship there. And then that's not the goal. The goal is not just to be family because the final goal is to be fruitful. That's that center. So that the whole goal is not just that I, I, I'm here and I love it and I'm so glad to be here. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is that I'm part of the mission of this place, of these people. That I'm not just here, but that I'm here to, to give what I have to give and to offer and to help and that Part of our purpose is to, to come together as the church and participate, not just consume. I'm not just here just to sit and receive, but I'm here to contribute. I'm part of this. I'm being fruitful. I'm giving something back in my life. Okay? So, I say that because God has sent us to all of these people to be evidence. Every day is an opportunity for us to give evidence to these people. Proof that God is alive and that God is good. That we are called to be witnesses to these people. That's what we do every day. That we're out there. We're giving evidence. They've already got evidence all around, but we're adding to the evidence for the people that live all around us. But here's the thing. There's another group. There's another circle out there. It's called the far away. It goes on the outside. Those are the people that do not live near us. They're beyond faces. We will not ever interact with them unless we go. There's no way to get to them. It's not part of our daily life. They're out there somewhere, people who are geographically beyond our lives. Now, here's the thing. Just as God never stops sending evidence to the people around us, he never stops sending evidence to the far away too. That's why God sent Paul and Barnabas. That's why we send people like Mel and Noah. That's why missionaries go. That's why we send. Yes, the people of Guadalajara have evidence. Yes, there are pastors and churches and missionaries that are giving evidence of God every day. God is simply sending us to add to the evidence. We're going as the Joe Schmo to add evidence and somebody else be like, I've been here 20 years doing that, but you come for one week and it makes, I don't know, it's not me. It's just how God works. Sometimes it just adds to the evidence. It's so important. And here's why it's so important, because what if we don't? What if we said, yeah, that's good and all, but it's still just not worth it? What if we don't go? We can say they have enough evidence. They don't need any more. See, the danger in not going is that the far away will eventually become the forgotten if we don't. That's what happens. If we don't go, if we don't make that a value, if we don't say it, it, we're adding to the evidence that, that that's important, then the people that are far away, out of sight, out of mind. Paul and Barnabas could have justified staying where they were. Would have been a whole lot easier for them. <laughs> if you don't know, after the people realized that Paul and Barnabas were not Zeus and Hermes, <laughs> uh, the tide changed pretty quickly. 
Um, they decided they were frauds. They dragged Paul out of, time, out of town and they stoned him to death. They left him for dead. They thought he was dead. He could have been dead. We don't know. Usually when you stone people, like everybody's throwing rocks at somebody's head and they're not moving, they're usually dead. The story tells us that somehow he just got up and walked away from the experience. Later on, Paul would talk about the fact that he bears on his body the marks of suffering for Christ. So that probably scarred him for life, literally. He mentions later that he was stoned, that this was something, not stoned like Jersey stone, like stoned literally rocks, right? Somehow he walks away from this experience. But can I suggest the whole experience probably felt like failure for Barnabas and Paul. We're here, we come, these people, we don't understand the language, they think we're gods, we just made a mess here, and now they want to kill me. Boy, that was a wasted week. Can I just say, I hope our week goes better? Yes, I certainly hope our week goes better. What good did it do for Paul and Barnabas to go there? The people riot and just try and kill them, and they move on to another city. Certainly would have been easier to leave the far away as the forgotten and be like, okay, whatever. After all, God's already given them evidence. They don't need more. But here's the thing. We can quickly fast forward to the end of this particular story, and eventually Paul and Barnabas come back to Lystra. And you know what was there? They come back just a few, like a little bit later, and they come back to Lystra. I don't know why they're going back. He just stones you there. Why they go back? And when they come back there, they find a church. There's people. There are believers. Because apparently, that evidence clicked for somebody. Not for everybody, but it clicked for somebody. And there are believers, people who had following Jesus. And Paul and Barnabas, they, they are like, oh, this is awesome. They celebrate, they appoint elders, they help, they support, and they move on rejoicing knowing that they're their suffering was not in vain. All they did was simply add to the evidence. There was already God's doing work there. They're just adding to it. It would have been easier, cheaper, and safer to stay, but God sent them and they went. And it accomplished something that may not have happened had they not gone. To be really simple about this, as long as God keeps sending, we just need to keep going. Because God cares about everybody from the far away to those right here that are family and fruitful. If it matters so much to God to keep sending more evidence, who are we to kind of decide when people have had enough evidence? Who, what gives us the right to be like, yeah, I think they got enough? God says, because here's the thing, God keeps sending evidence to us. So I'm grateful for that, and I don't want that to stop. We're going to close this morning with communion. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And once a month, we receive communion together. It's a, a symbolic meal. If you did not receive communion elements on the way in, just raise your hand, and our ushers will make sure that you get some. So we've got, we've got a few here. So if, if you can find, keep your hands up until everybody's been served there. Uh, they'll, come, they'll come get you here. Here you go. I got you. All right. Um, All right, um, once a month we receive communion together, and I would advise you now to start working on these so that you know how to open the top because it's going to take you a few minutes. Um, we receive communion together as a symbolic meal. It's a reminder not to forget what Jesus did for us on the cross. And as I thought, each, each month when we do this, I try and think of how to connect communion to make it relevant to what we're talking about. And I thought about how to connect that to the message today. It hit me. God had given the world plenty of evidence of himself. Nature all around gave evidence to God. From manna to miracles to favor and crops, the provision of God was evidence all around them. Inside of every heart was joy and peace and hope and these feelings that were evidence of God. And yet... God sent Jesus to add to the evidence. In the context of human history, Jesus came on a short-term missions trip. He was only here a short time. He didn't have to come, 
But God was adding to the evidence that he had already given to us. And Jesus came to be the greatest evidence ever of God's love and his goodness. See, communion is a profound reminder that God keeps sending people. He keeps sending you and me as evidence because he genuinely desires for everybody to know him. Why does God keep calling people to go as missionaries? Why does God keep sending people when there's already people there? He's just adding to the evidence. He's not willing. He's willing to let people go their own way, but he's not willing to leave them without evidence. He's just going to find and send wherever they are. I'm going to keep sending you evidence. You can't hide from me. Whatever corner of the earth you go to, I will send someone to you there. People in Lystra, man, we're, we're nobody. They ain't got a synagogue. They're just a little town in the middle of nowhere, and God's sending arguably the greatest missionary ever, Paul, to go there. God, see, this story isn't so much about Lystra. It's not so much about Paul and Barnes, but it's about God. It's about his heart to continue to come after us. And perhaps you're here today and you go, you know, I'm not sure where I, where I stand on this whole God thing. Well, guess what? God's going to keep sending you evidence. This is one step. I mean, somebody else could say the very same thing I just said, and maybe it makes a whole lot more sense when they say it. That's common. That's common. When I say stuff, people go, I don't make sense. Then somebody else is like, oh, that makes sense. I feel like I just said that. But God's just adding to the evidence because he loves you. Not just doing overkill. He loves you. Perhaps you're here today and God is doing something in you and maybe he's sending you or calling you. I don't know. I want to challenge you. We desperately need missionaries in our world. Desperately need missionaries. Not just, not just talking to the young people here either. Young people, you can listen to this. If God is calling you, you respond. But not just young people. It doesn't matter how old you are. God keeps calling. God didn't. You know, Barnabas and Paul weren't young. My parents weren't young when they decided to leave New Jersey and go be missionaries in Mexico. They were in their 50s. Never too late. What is God doing in you? Scripture says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I think it's not because... God doesn't call enough laborers. I think it's because a lot of laborers aren't willing to say yes. That's what happens when the far away become forgotten. Can't let that happen. Communion, again, profound reminder that God loves so much that he keeps sending. He sent his son to continue to be evidence. So today, I invite you to take the bread. It's a symbol of his body. Who knows how many times you and I have walked past evidence of God? <laughs> how many times God has sent evidence to us and it just went like whoosh, right over our heads? So I just want you to take a moment right now and thank God that he sent his son for you. That God continues to send evidence for you. Just right now, where you are, just close your eyes. Take a moment. And perhaps you need more evidence. You're like, I'm still not sure, God. Just say God would help me to... Help me to see it. God, if you've got evidence, I, I want to see it. Give me eyes to see it. Help me not miss it. Just take a minute where you are and thank God. And talk to God. Lord, we thank you for this bread, for what it represents. Lord, it symbolizes your body broken for us, given on the cross, that you came, that you came to be that in-person physical evidence. Your word tells us that in you we saw the Father, that you revealed God to us by coming, that you gave us even greater evidence than we had ever had before. You're the greatest evidence ever, God. That what we hold in our hands is a reminder that you came. You didn't have to. It cost you. Lord, this world killed you because there are people that didn't believe in what you came to testify to. Lord, thank you for your willingness to come, for your great love for us. We remember how much you love us. 
Let's eat together. And now the cup. It's a symbol. God's blood shed for us on the cross. If I can open it. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I'm not the only one, I know. There we go. It's the ultimate evidence of love, the ultimate a symbol of his sacrifice. Just want you to pause. Thank God that he's never left you without evidence of himself. And I want you to think, who is God sending you to? Has God called you to go? Have the far away become the forgotten for you? Say, God, this cup reminds us of sacrifice. It reminds us that there's a cost to love. That love isn't free. It's not not easy, Lord. It's costly. It requires everything of us. Your word says no greater love has anyone that they would lay down their life for another. And so, God, would we not withhold love from anybody? You didn't withhold your love from us. You gave it all. Lord, as we hold this cup, a reminder of 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 the length to which you would go for us. Lord, that how far you would go for us to to lay it all down. Likewise, as we drink, would we commit ourselves to going, to sending, to loving the far away, refusing to let them be forgotten. Thank you. Take a moment where you are. If you need to confess, repent this morning do that in this moment. Just thank God for his great sacrifice for you. Lord, we thank you for what this cup represents. Lord, let let us be the people who truly put our faith in action. Not just talk it, but truly willing to sacrifice because we love. Willing to go and to give whatever you ask of us so that all may hear and know. May we add to the evidence. May our lives add to the evidence wherever we go. In your name we pray. Let's drink. We're going to close with a song. One of my favorite songs. It's a prayer, really. It's a prayer that God would stir our hearts for the nations. I invite you to stand as we sing this morning. You say asking you will receive whatever you need and you say pray and I'll hear from heaven I'll heal your land you say Your glory will fill the earth Like water the sea And you say Lift up your eyes The harvest is here The kingdom is near You say Ask it, I'll give the nations to you, oh Lord, that's the cry of my heart, distant shores and the islands will see your light as it rises on us. You said, 
your glory will fill the earth like water in the sea and you said lift up your eyes cause the harvest is here oh the kingdom is near you said ask it give to send and that's all well and good and that's part of our part of our responsibility as a church it's what we do just want to encourage you right now if God is God is moving in your heart and you're feeling something all I'm going to say is after the service at some point I encourage you to reach out either to one of our pastors here after the service perhaps go talk to Mel and Noah but take action. Don't just keep it to yourself. Don't suppress what God is doing in you. God is calling you. It's something he's planted in you. There will be nothing as satisfying as fulfilling the call God's put in your life. Lord, speak to us. Give us sensitive hearts to you. Lord, let us not have made up our mind what we're going to do with our lives. But let us offer you our lives as evidence to send and to use however you see fit. We are truly your vessels. Use us. I'm going to close. I'm going to invite our ushers to close this morning as we receive our tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask Noah, would you come on up? Would you just close us in prayer, Noah? I'm going to ask Noah just to pray over us. 
going to sing that song again as we close. That's a great song. love that song. He's going to ask Noah to pray for us. And again, just encourage you. God is speaking to you. Respond to that. Noah, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. And we thank you so much that that your voice is speaking to us today, Lord. Thank you for the steps that are being taken in response to your heart, God. But I just pray that um, in this moment, Lord, those that are sensing just something moving in their spirit or in their heart, God, I pray that they won't they won't let it go, Lord. They won't be like, that was strange. I don't know what that was about. All right, let's go eat. Lord God, I just pray that you'll allow the each person that's sensing something to, to stay in that moment, to, to wait on you, God. Lord, you're doing something. You're moving, but we have to be still. We have to listen, God. We can't just go about our day and say, well, God will tap me on the shoulder. No, he's tapping right now. He's, 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 he's saying, no, no, I, I have something, but you have to wait for me. God, I just pray for that, that stillness, Lord, maybe not in this exact second, but at some point today that, 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 that stirring won't go away, but we will sit, God, because your heart, Lord, is so massive, God. Your, your vision for our world is so huge that we couldn't even possibly dream of containing even a portion of it, God. But we do need to sit and let your heart wash over us to open our eyes, to open our minds, God, that to what you're doing, Lord. You're doing amazing things in this world, doing amazing things all around this world, but our eyes need to be open, our hearts need to be sensitive, God. And so I speak that over every person here, an open mind and a sensitive heart to what the Holy Spirit is saying, Lord. I speak blessing over the team that is going to Mexico this week. I pray that you'll go before them as I know that you have. Surround them, God. And I know for a fact that your Holy Spirit does something when we are yielded. And even through language barriers, God, you do something more than what we can do in the natural. So just anoint them. Lord, I pray for those who are not going, but who are sending, who are supporting. I pray that they will be fervent in prayer, Lord God, because the, the fervent prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it is effective, God. It changes things, Lord. Bless this church, Lord. Bless each one that is here, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.